The novels of Hugh McLennan tell us about ourselves. Before he began to write, uh, Canada had perhaps little consciousness of itself. But he has written about our cities and our wide landscapes and our peoples with insight and power. We are very glad to welcome him today to Scarborough College. You will hear him answering questions from members of the college. Dr. McLennan, uh, your return of the Sphinx seems to be a rather naive appraisal of the French-English relations in Canada today. Have your views been changed by the o October crisis last year? Heavens, no. I forecast it. <laughs> uh, it wasn't an appraisal of Quebec, it was a novel. Any appraisals I've, I've tried to do of Quebec have been in some form of journalistic way, but that wasn't a... I don't think it was a naive novel. So it was more the father-son conflict you were getting at? It was... A novelist doesn't really know, Irma, how these things happen. I am not in a position now to tell you certain things I found out later, but let's put it this way, that when that book came out, uh, it <coughs> got far better reviews abroad than it got here. Somebody sent me, somebody completely unknown from Paris, a, a column from the Figo, Le Figaro, which announced that one of the, the German student riots were aimed to destroy the government of Willy Brandt, that one of the two ringleaders was the son of Willy Brandt. <laughs> uh, this has happened in case after case that I could mention in Quebec and in the United States, too. Do you not set out to consciously, though, set out, uh, set your novels in, in the Canadian landscape and to deal with Canadian problems, or is that just, is really where you put them incidental, or, or doesn't it matter to you? Well, it's, yes, everybody that has ever written fiction has put, uh, has set the scenes in his own country, hasn't he? If it's serious work, because you draw this up as it were through the pores. Every Russian novelist has done this. Even when Turgenev was living in Paris, he did it, didn't he? He set his stuff in Russia. If you use the term problems, <coughs> it's the all-purpose word today of the technological society, and I don't like it. As far as a technical problem is concerned, fiction is full of it. But fiction doesn't set out to ask pro solve problems. It sets out to ask questions in action and character. Do you have anything in the works uh, as a follow-on from Sphinx, seeing as it was that, a certain... I'm writing another novel, yes, but I don't yes. think it's... Yes, it's to some extent. This shades into it, but mm. um, uh, these things are fundamentally universal subjects. Now, I wasn't conscious that this was an Oedipus at Colonus till I was almost finished with it. And suddenly this line came in. One more step would have set us free, but the Sphinx returned. Because it's the only... Uh, this happens quite often. And I think that since last fall, finally, well, it was quite a, an hour of truth mm -hmm. for a lot of people, though truth wasn't appreciated by some people outside Quebec. Mm -hmm. Do you think the uh, literary community in Canada can set out and create a national literature in the way that the uh, group of seven created a, a national style of painting? Oh, it's a way ahead of the group of seven now. You think so? You oh, think that... Uh, the, uh, if you want to put it this way, the first man of letters who wrote truly of Canada at all was uh, old C. G. Charles G. D. Roberts. He at least uh, described the wilderness of Canada as it then was. It was what he knew in New Brunswick. That was ahead of the group of seven. He didn't try to pretend it was a part of England or a part of the United States. But uh, it didn't have the same impact that the visual thing did to the group of seven, particularly because they dealt with the shield country. The Canadian literature is a far, far bigger volume than that. Uh, the trouble is this country has got no idea what goes on in it. Uh, as whether there's some kind of vested interest in the center of communications in Toronto, I don't know. Whether the fact there's only about one or two Canadian publishers here and the others are branch plants. Whether the fact that the, Canada's national magazines are time in the Reader's Digest. 
<laughs> I don't know, but I do know Rob Davis had something when he said that no Toronto audience will laugh at a joke written by a Canadian unless it has been guaranteed to him that joke has previously been laughed at in London and New York. <laughs> <laughs> that's not mine, that's Rob's. <laughs> Sir, uh, in about the characters in your books, the women all seem so stylized, except for Heather in Two Solitudes. Did you ever know a woman like her? Or did it just well, happen by uh, chance? They seem stylized to you, do they? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I, I, I didn't think Heather was a particularly interesting character at all, frankly. She's a nice girl, but you thought she was good, did you? Or yes. at least not stylized. I thought she was very different. Original. She brought mm. something fresh into it. Well, I think yeah. she was a nice girl, yes. I, <laughs> I had a great deal of difficulty with women at first. Women, men writers are not too good. The French are very good with women. The French Canadians aren't, but they, unless they are women themselves. Uh, generally speaking, since Shakespeare's time, I think, with some exceptions, some notable exceptions, men aren't so good with women characters, but I don't, I've never heard anybody say that that was the best character I ever did, but um, personally, uh, I think I didn't do badly at all on the Sphinx with women. I learned a lot of, know much more about them than I used to. <laughs> this, this brings up something Wait else. Uh, your treatment of sex, I mean, compared to, um, novelists today, uh, your treatment of sex is pretty tame, and I was wondering if you would explain the, the thought behind this. Well, like they're, pretty, they're pretty explicit, mm -hmm. and uh, you kind of take, you, take the reader right to the bed, and then the next page begins, mm -hmm. you know, early next morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I know that the present stage of American literature has been, that country is so impoverished and everything it eats is food is no good. <laughs> it's beer is no good. Mm -hmm. It's cities are no good. The only, it's, the only thing that they've got left is this, you see. But they, they have reduced sex to a long exercise in mechanical engineering. <laughs> and uh, this, it's like a report from a ringside, you know. Now, it's not a very original activity, really. And uh, all right, I don't do this particularly well. I try, but don't forget that I, have, I, I don't see any particular. I always have objected to selling books for a scandal for a reason that would be uh, what the French call a succès du scandale. I see. I'm too stubborn. I don't like the right to, to to sell them for that reason. You could no more have have uh, have got a book published. Uh, when I was, by the time I'd written uh, five novels containing stuff that they have today, you, you, it, would, it would be banned. It would be confiscated. I was a witness for Lady Chatterley's lover in 1962 when we lost the case in Montreal. <laughs> but don't forget, this is very new. I don't think it's any improvement. God, hasn't anybody any imagination? <laughs> I'm not you know, I'm not critical of it. I no, but I mean, it, it stands answer. out. Uh, it stands out to you, but do you realize what it does? It would it surprise you to know that I've got deluges of letters for even for Barbara rising in two solids for immorality? <laughs> but the Montreal Gazette. The Montreal Gazette wrote a whole editorial denouncing two solitudes for sexual immorality. <laughs> the Presbyterian Record. Uh, produced 31 charges of criminal libel in which, among other things, they accused me of increasing the venereal disease rate in Canada. <laughs> I don't think that any writer ever got such a tribute to his vitality as that. <laughs> <laughs> things have changed, my friend. It's not... Apart from what you call the mechanical quality of much in sexual writing, do you think that this change on the whole is a has at least a positive potential, because it seems that one of the themes that you deal with fairly consistently is the Puritan quality of, of Canadian life. Yes, well, it's far less puritanical than it was, and it's fundamentally, Canada, Canadians were fundamentally, except in some areas, less puritanical than the Americans, because Puritanism of that kind came from New England, 
which came from the Puritan Revolution in London, in England, and was what it was. Underneath, more of them, the French and Scots and Irish or Celtic people are not natural Puritans. But the point I think you were really making, I think that it's a matter of taste. And in a Puritan society, you know, you, you tear a Puritan and gets, he gets loose. He never knows where to stop. He goes in like some guy, a hungry man in a smorgasbord, just reaching around. And uh, this is what's happened now. Really, I mean, if you look back in the 17th century, one of the worst rakes of that period was the son of the most rigid Puritan of the generation before. I mean, it was a reaction against this. One of the comments of yours that I've, I've been interested in is in, um, I think it was a CBC talk that you made concerning um, the watch that ends the night, and you talked about shaping new bottles for new wine in connection with what the themes that you were dealing with in that book. And that comment interested me because in relationship to many of the other developments that were happening in the modern novel at that time, it did not seem to be technically a very experimental book. Look, it wasn't an experimental book. It was a book that had a form, I think, that worked. And uh, I'll ask you a question. What was, what was new about that book in its form? I don't know. Well, it was written in both the first and the third person. It wasn't supposed to be possible. That's is that an <laughs> experiment? No. <laughs> I didn't find somebody's diary. I did it by a little bit of this stuff. It was the only way it could be done. And uh, it's, it's just a matter of an illusion. Also, the question there was how to experiment for its own sake is worthless. Uh, if, uh, if you have a thing to do, what I was trying to do was to have a sense of time so that nobody was working through mechanical flashbacks, mm -hmm. so that things moved back and forth within uh, time perfectly naturally. And I think they did in that book. Yes. You see, if the uh, two critics don't have to write novels, and if it's, it's really like an automobile. If you take a, 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 an automobile that's well, Bill, get one, I understand, between Tuesday and Thursday off the assembly <laughs> line. It's got a better chance than the other, according to Arthur Haley. Uh, you don't know what's going on under the hood of that thing if it's operating. You shouldn't know what's going on under the hood of the novel either if it's operating. But if you get one from a junkyard, like I did when I was a student, I learned a lot about cars. Would you say that you have tried to develop a technique that will communicate quite widely to an audience uh, in this country. Well, or in any country. In any country, yes. Uh, yes, that has. It's a very good question, Professor Madison. Uh, you see, if you start from this principle, which, that nobody can write with any sense of authority in a form as intimate as the novel, a play, yes, he can do it. He's uh, very unlikely to be able to do it in any country but his own because a novel depends on a vast range of accurate details, even on a gesture. One place name wrong and you've lost credibility. Well, at the same time, drama depends upon the familiar, you see. Yes. You can't have otherwise, it's just an accident. Uh, therefore, you have got to render your, uh, your background, as it were, visible, audible. Joyce does it superbly. I've been fascinated by our literary critics in Canada who venerate James Joyce. And for about 20 years, the academic ones, and they're still at it, would sneer at any Canadian writer who did exactly what Joyce did, because he had to. To forge within the conscience of the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. Because there'd never been an Irish writer before Joyce. They'd all been Protestant Englishmen, right? Or of stage Irishmen. Uh, this was how it was in Ireland. Now, we were supposed to be Mounties. We were supposed to be Frontiers, but when we were all sitting on our tails in Toronto and Montreal, we weren't like that, like the stereotype. Now, this, as Professor Madison suggested, was a specific technical problem. And in the earlier books, one had to build one stage and do it as unobtrusively as possible, so therefore 
some bright boy says he's a sociologist or something like that. <laughs> well, uh, all right, so is Balzac. At a certain stage, this was necessary. It's by no means necessary now. Not necessary at all. After all, a country becomes interesting once it becomes criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you wrote a, a short, uh, I guess it was for a journal, called Our Two Solitudes, about French and English Canada. Just a minute, where? Saturday, Saturday night, was it? No. What was this again? Uh, it was a, a short piece of writing about, it was entitled Our Two Solitudes. When did it disappear? Quite a while ago. <laughs> oh, I don't remember it. Uh, that uh, last year, for instance, I had a piece in Maclean's this summer that was actually written last February. And Peter Newman wanted me to wrote me a letter saying if I could make to some extent personal what it felt like to somebody with my feelings about the country to see the two solitudes coming farther and going farther and farther apart. So I said, this is going to be a perfect lead-off, because what I have not been seeing is not them going farther and farther apart, but coming closer and closer together. If they're farther and farther apart, it was a quiet country. When they come together, it could be like the hemispheres of that little bomb, you know. Uh, you see, as long as we had an emotional capital in London, and Ottawa was an administrative centre, and as long as you had the fundamental capital of Quebec in Rome, and Quebec an administrative centre, the whole part of Confederation, until very recently, was to keep them as far apart as possible. And they did. Montreal was a visible picture of it. French in the East End, English in the West End, low Catholic churches all over the place in the East End, couple of English armories in the West End and an old man's land in between, you know, like a Belgium along St. Catherine Street where they used to shop together. And then when the Catholic Church blew up in Quebec in a few years in the 60s, and Quebec began to take charge of itself and a large middle class, highly educated, suddenly emerged. This was, the thing was, there's, was it evolution or revolution? So far it's been evolution. So they were coming closer together. What do you predict uh, then? What's the next stage in, in the I evolutionary think, process? If you ask me my honest opinion, I think we had the showdown last fall. And it's over then? I didn't say over. I hope <laughs> not. But no. No, our big challenges from the States, of course, it always was. You, you've made a couple kind of uh, mildly anti well, not mildly anti American swipes. Uh, and this has, you know, I mean, the sudden rise in, in Canadian nationalism has been coupled with a rise in Canadian anti-Americanism. Do you think that Canadian anti-Americanism is important in the shaping of a Canadian identity, that it's always been there and always needs to be there? There has never been a country in the history of the world that ever became a country which did not become so because it was forced into a position to defend its territory. Uh, the English were violently anti-Spanish when, when the Spanish were ordered by the Pope to knock England out, sure. The English had been good friends with the French until shortly after that, when uh, after only got uh, died, uh, once again they were fighting for control over uh, the mercantile situation in the world, and England was an island. Now, Canada has not, Canadians aren't anti-American. I couldn't possibly compete in being anti-American with about 50 or 60 million Americans. I don't have to live there. I mean, they really hate that country. I mean, look at their <laughs> students. Why are they all coming up here? If you had the Pentagon and the FBI and the CIA beating down your neck all the time, if you had to live in New York and Chicago, if you were a black, or if you were a Jew, or if you were almost anybody, you're a minority in the States. In the meantime, you're, you are told that you're all a pluribus unum and so forth. But you're for people are freer here, that's all. Uh, but uh, when I said this about the, what's coming up with the States, it's here already. The Americans are running out of certain natural energy resources. They're running out of water. And uh, they are also 
they have last Asia. Therefore, like the Roman Empire, they have to close in on, on, on the Western Hemisphere, and part this North Western Hemisphere may well be their policy. I don't know, but it's beginning to look like it. Therefore, we are 22 million people against 100, 210 million people. I have nothing hostile against Americans, but I just want to, I, I'd like to say bad, that's all. Do you think Canada can provide a focus for education and the media and such like, instead of America and Britain shoving their literatures down everybody's throats? Well, I think literature is terrifically competitive to begin with this. Mm. There is no place where a Canadian writer gets a worse break than he gets in England. Uh, particularly if he's got a Scotch name, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the English don't believe the Scotch can write. And uh, they never could understand Burns. They used to like Scott fairly well. But that's about it. I got a review once from John London's Weekly about, uh, it was my book, uh, Each Man's Son. This is a book by a Scotsman living in Canada, about Scotsmen living in Canada, and if anybody wants to read it, the price is eight and six. <laughs> <laughs> well, to the point, anyway. <laughs> No, I don't, I think that's highly competitive. I think some of the great, great literature, if a limited quantity of it, has come from South Africa. One of the most prominent of English novelists, and I won't mention him here, I like him, entertained me in London, oh, about 10 years ago. He had some reviewers in, and one of them said, don't you think it's about time, Charles, if we should uh, really, uh, Get, throw out these South African writers, don't you think so? Like that. I said, who the hell are you? <laughs> uh, ultimately, it is very competitive. The last area of the territorial imperative which will ever be given up is literature. Uh, this is the last thing. The French will hang on to that in France. And if such breaks as they gave French-Canadian writers was solely by orders of Mont General, the French now find they're not getting anything out of France. Uh, me as privately, the French in Paris, I've heard them say that one can't understand the French Canadians when they speak. Mm -hmm. I used to hear Englishmen say you couldn't understand Americans when they spoke, but I never heard a Scotsman say that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, uh, I mean, recently the government has been helping out the artistic community in Canada uh, with the creation of the CRTC, with the uh, CFDC. Uh, do you think that they should do something to help the writing community in the way that the Ontario government like, gave its loan to Jack McClellan? Well, that's, those are two questions, aren't they? Right. Well, you you said mean, do you, you think they were right to give Jack the money, or do you think... Uh... <laughs> well, that's, well, I'm not asking if that's the right way to help, but do you think that they should do, look into the possibility of, of uh, in, you know, providing a, uh, publishing houses for our writers to be published in, to... to uh, to get their start somehow. Yes, the thing is this. I sometimes get tired when I think back of certain thankless labors. I never asked the government to give anybody any money or give me any money or anything else. I've got a number of governor general's awards that they never got any money. That came later. But anything that would allow a writer to live, I was all in favor of it. But the chief thing that will allow a writer to live is outlets. And he shouldn't be staked too much for that, otherwise he becomes a freeloader. And, but what this country has let happen is the destruction of their outlets. I had something to do with what ended up in the O'Leary Commission that Ethan Baker put on, uh, because owing to a very complex advertising structure, I won't go into it here, you'll find it in the O'Leary Report, none of our magazines could compete uh, for advertising revenues because of the split run system the Americans were working. And regarding Canada through a, a branch plan, incorporate the Reader's Digest, incorporate Time as a Canadian publication of Canada Limited. Now, the same thing goes, you can see it very obviously on television when they pause for this message. They will bring up a scene of a, uh, the thing has been done in Michigan, you know, that great gasoline. You're going along in that car, and uh, this is great performance. You've got a man with just graying hair, just the right age to have a good fat wallet and getting tired of his wife. But 
<laughs> some nice little girl sitting there in hot pants beside him. And they're bowling right along with that great gasoline to you know where. Well, uh, uh, that has been made in Michigan, and then you'll suddenly see a flash of Lake Louise or Peggy's Cove or something. Now, that's a split room. Didn't cost them anything except to tab this thing in so that you think it's your own gasoline. But it's not. It was made in Michigan. So that is what they were doing to our magazines, and suddenly they all practically died. And McLean's was reduced to a shell. And George Ball of the State Department came up here after, first of all, Deef, uh, Deef and Baker was caught up in an election. He didn't pass legislation. It had existed before, only to give us an even break. That was all. And they then accepted time and digest. Then he said that if he, that Pearson said that, well, it couldn't be granted to any other publications. Up come George at all, the big troubleshooter from the State Department. And here I quote, and the whole thing was canned. Judy Lamar said in her book, she didn't know what it was all about, except that they were told on the nail by Ball that they would regard this as uh, uh, more hostile to the United States than sending tanks to Cuba. In other words, to have any magazines of our own. Well, it takes, uh, Canadians are so dumb, it takes them so long to see that all these things piling up. But why shouldn't they be a target? It's the greatest prize in the world is this country. So now that has come out as to why the government yielded on this, even of all people, Walter Gordon had to. Because if he hadn't been able, if he hadn't yielded on that, they wouldn't have given him the automobile pack. This was in the paper recently. Now they're going to try to can that. I, I suspect that this conversation can go, go on for quite a long time, but I'm afraid I must uh, break in and make some kind of a pause. We've enjoyed very much having you, Dr. McLennan. We've enjoyed the way you've spoken to us so frankly and interestingly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and thank you all very much. It's really been fun for me. <laughs> <laughs>